so you can see me. Hello, Nick. Hello, everyone. Right then. So, first things first, the important stuff. Iron brew. I'm hoping I remember to send a link to my girlfriend. I think I did. If I didn't, I apologise. So, hello everyone. <sighs> Afternoon, evening, salut. As you'll notice, it's a slightly different setup from normally. Um, I have put it up using a portal projector and I'm hoping everything's going to work. This is my wardrobe. I'm not sure if you can see this. We're going to hope you can see it. Mm, that's nice. Right, so what are we here to do today? Well, this is a presentation I gave at a Cambridge conference about two years ago. No, three years ago. It was November 2017. It was to the British Commission for Military History. As you can see, I had a beard then still. I've had the beard there for a while. Hello, everyone. Hello Sal, hello Paul, hello, welcome, to, uh, thank you for joining, and it's rather a fun thing, it's a fun paper, but it's a paper which hasn't been aired since, so I'm going to give it, I do say again, I'm trying this out and seeing this works, if this works, I will try it again, but just so you can get an idea of the state the space is in, there you go, there's the projector, and this is me. So we're going to hope it all works. So, what are we looking at today? We're looking at the town class cruisers. But what does it mean to be a cruiser? Well, there is a definition of a cruiser, which I usually tend to use in these circumstances. And it comes from Lord Hill Norton, who we're going to say pretty much knows what he's talking about. And his designation is the cruiser indicates her principal task it's cruising cruisers are about presence they're about winning the peace as well as the war they're about exercising control of the sea the battle fleet is what gets you with control of the sea fighting the war is what gets you to control the sea cruisers are what about demonstrating control of the sea now i do apologize to an extent because it's a little bit harder for me to read the screen because it's a little bit further away so if i miss a question just type it again and i will pick it up and if i don't manage to pick up a question today tweet them at me and i will answer them so i'm going to apologize up in advance now the interesting thing though is cruisers have always been pretty difficult to define it's why i often say modern warships are cruisers because of the way they are expected to act the way they're supposed to do things because a cruiser was about so many different things, everything was a cruiser or nothing was a cruiser. You know, prior to World War I, and I have the list in front of me, there's Scout, Battle, Armoured, Auxiliary. Last week we were looking at the C-class cruisers, which were Light, Armoured. Again, it doesn't make sense. There are so many different definitions of the cruiser, it's beyond belief. But the reason is there's so many definitions is because there are so many missions they have to do. A cruiser must also be large enough to keep the sea in any weather, fast enough to be the eyes of the fleet, to scout and to shadow, to overhaul the enemy in chase, and powerful enough to overwhelm the enemy with her guns, though not to slog it out in the line of battle against heavily armed ships. Basically, a cruiser is supposed to do everything. And the cruisers have to. What I always find interesting about this definition is it's written in 1982. This definition is written in the year of the Falklands War. And they still haven't defined it now. Because it always starts off with, this must be the definition. And then I go this. Nope. It actually continues the whole way down the page. And I am literally taking out bits from a book. Um, I have the book in here. Hmm, it's over there. And it's... 
about so thick and it's got it in it everywhere. But Lord Hill Norton is great and it's an interesting discussion. So for what we're talking about today, we're going to be looking at what the Royal Navy was doing in cruisers in the 1920s and 30s, what it wanted for cruisers in the 1920s and 30s, and it wanted them to do a lot. Remember, it couldn't build battleships. The Royal Navy couldn't do what it needed to do with battleships. So it needed to do it with cruisers. And cruisers are complicated beasts. They do many different things. But this is also why you get the difference between the 8-inch and the 6-inch cruiser and why you get navies going for an 8-inch cruiser versus a 6-inch cruiser. Because it's what do you want your cruisers to do. So, the Royal Navy is looking for a cruiser to fulfil both functions. Performing the traditional task of protecting the country's merchant marine from interference and at the same time denying the use of a seat in the shipping of the enemies. Now... This is what the Royal Navy is looking at. They want the cruiser to fulfil these tasks. And hello again to everyone. It's difficult, though, building a ship to do this. To start off, they're looking at trade protection. And this is the trade we're talking about protecting. Remember, again, I was talking about this on Thursday with what Britain was looking at. Look at all the trade is going, and that is going around the world. This is what the Royal Navy's worried about. This is what they're scared of. And I know it's more difficult probably on with the setup to pick it out, but you can see the thick, dark lines. That's where there's heavy trade. It's unsurprising those are the areas where they have a lot more presence. Because where you have more trade, you have more presence. Now there's blockade. Basically they're planning a distant blockade. But that's also still about trade protection. And here's how you blockade Japan. <laughs> Not sure if you can see that up there. Don't worry, the picture will be tweeted out um, at some point. I've got to set up on my Twitter account to come out. But this is their plan for how to dispossess cruisers around the world to blockade Japan in a war. This is what the Royal Navy's thinking about. How do you blockade Japan? So when the Royal Navy says, we need 70 cruisers, they're not saying it because they really, really love cruisers, although they do really, really love cruisers. They're saying it because they're looking at this mission. Hong Kong alone has 28 cruisers based at it. You've got pockets of 4444, all these cruisers around the world. And these have got to be working cruisers. So... That's going to, because any number of 70 cruisers they have, they're going to have to deduct the number of cruisers which are down for maintenance, the cruisers which are too old to be useful in a fighting line. Remember the C-class cruisers again? They're not useful for fighting ships. They're great for air defence, but they can't cover any of these roles. So you're looking at these cruisers, which is why it's always funny when people turn around to go, ah, yes, but the Royal Navy was being building B-type cruisers, which were the Leander class and the Ar and Arafusa class and these vessels. And I go, yes, but the trouble was the Royal Navy didn't have space for B-class cruisers, so those things were going to be involved as well. And in fact, the Leander class and the Arafusa class were pretty much going to be given these jobs in this area. So if any Japanese surface raider got to this area, got problems. Not sure if you can see anything on that map. I'm hoping you can. Um, hopefully you can see that though. So, what are the factors which are going into cruiser development? And there are factors going into cruiser development, and hopefully I'm not racing through this. Well, there's the legacy of World War I. The Royal Navy, what do they want for a cruiser? What do they want them to do? Well, they wanted them to be part of the destroyer force and look after destroyers. That was part of the thing. But they also wanted them to go around the world. You know, World War I had shown that the Royal Navy's biggest problem was going to be dealing with submarines, but also dealing with surface raiders. Submarines are going to be the biggest problem in the local area of the North Atlantic. They're, that's where they're going to be a problem, because that's where they've got the range for. Surface raiders are going to be a problem because they can be anywhere in the world. Because they can refuel so much easier. They can resupply so much easier. They can carry so much more stores in the first place. They can self-maintain to an extent far more than submarines because they have more crew and they have more space facilities. Surface raiders could be anywhere. You know, you have these two nightmares and both are equally bad. 
One's a nightmare because of the sheer quantity of damage it can do. One is a nightmare because of the sheer spread of damage it can do. Both are equally problematic if you're a navy in that sitting there going, I have to secure the world. <laughs> good morning. I, I wish it was morning. It's afternoon for me, but you know, good morning. Uh, during the interwar period, there isn't peace. <laughs> there is no peace in the 1920s and 30s. There is constant fighting going on. And the Spanish Civil War is just one in a long line of it. There are incidents in China. There are incidents in Africa. There are incidents all around the world. There are whole wars all around the world. So I really hate it when people describe the 1920s and 30s of the interwar years. But I have to use it myself because it's how people understand it. But the World War One and World War Two are world wars, yes. But it doesn't mean nothing happens for 20 years, and this filters into design. Plus, the Royal Navy has two new powers, USA and Japan, to do. Quickly, they become actually their favourite naval powers from a cruiser's perspective. Because the Japanese and the Americans quickly start focusing all their love on their big cruisers, on their 8-inch cruisers. You know, cruisers which are going to take part in slogging out across the Pacific. They are much beloved by the Royal Navy because cruisers which are built to slog it out across the Pacific are not going to be surface raiders the Royal Navy is going to have to deal with. And you have the naval treaties. Naval treaties are a complicated beast because the traditional perspective is always that they hampered the Royal Navy. They hurt the Royal Navy. They were shamelessly actually used by the Royal Navy. Okay, the Royal Navy lost some things, won some things. Most of the definitions were actually defined by the Royal Navy. If you look at consistently the service which turns up with the largest number of people, the largest number of diplomats, does the largest amount of diplomacy it's well, uh, itself along going on, it's usually the Royal Navy. They really do turn into a very diplomatic force around these treaties. And the interesting joke is that the Washington Naval Treaty, uh, one of the American diarists I've read from that period, actually stated he thought he was, it was it being hosted in London, there were that many Royal Navy uniforms around versus US Navy uniforms. That is how serious the Royal Navy took it, but also how they used it. The six inch guns, the eight inch guns, they suited the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy was building cruisers which had, at the time, a 7.9 inch gun. So eight inch was the maximum they really wanted to go to. The Americans, the Japanese and the Ger and not the Germans, but the French, definitely, all tried to argue for a bigger gun for the cruisers, a bigger maximum gun. The Royal Navy won it with the 8-inch. And mainly by going, well, you know, the largest cruisers we're building have a 7.9-inch, so you all have a point twelfth of an inch advantage. Didn't work out that way, but we'll leave that to one side. And so it goes through the 1930s and all sorts of things are built. And to start with, the Royal Navy does focus on the counties. They do focus on the eight inch cruisers because they are thinking in terms of firepower of your big hit, of your big hit knocking your enemy out. But that changes as time goes on. And they slowly evolve what they want. And one of the interesting things is one of the papers I found in 1935, so written while Admiral Henderson was Third Sea Lord, listed the factors leading cruiser ev ev evolution during a certain period. In 1888 to 1902, it was constructors' materialism. It was what people, the yards were offering. It's what builders were prepared to build. 1902 to 1914, it was naval materialism. It was the navies competing against each other. 1914 to 1921 was actually naval requirements, but note that the 21 comes with a question mark after it, as if they're not quite sure it finishes. And then after 1921 to present, it's political requirements which are guiding cruisers. Well... That suggests to me, A, naval requirements are still a pretty big factor. But also, B, political factor requirements are affecting cruiser design because cruisers are now more important. Prior to World War One, prior to the treaties, the battleships, the battle cruisers, the big capital ships were the critical state, uh, examples of national status and national power. 
after World War I, when you can no longer build as many battleships, when you can no longer build what you like in terms of uh, these things, and when battlecruisers are certainly not as attractive as they had been prior to World War I, suddenly cruisers become the state, national status symbol. They become critical. And again, the Royal Navy makes a strange decision, because you can understand other navies then focusing on the 8-inch cruiser, the big heavy cruiser. They focus on that above else. The Royal Navy in the 1930s focuses on the 6-inch cruiser. And it starts out as the M-Class. And there is a reason it starts out as the M-Class. Because the Royal Navy are designing it and they're working out what they're going to do with it. And as they're working out what they're going to do with it, and I'm going to leave discussing of guns to a bit later, actually when the presentation's sort of over and I turn the camera around and we're looking that way, because I will have to exit the PowerPoint to get up my really up-to-date spreadsheet on gun calibers and their various trade-offs. So please excuse me skipping guns till the end. But they decide and focus on the six-inch gun cruiser. And they focus on the six inch because the six inch guns offer the perfect firepower, the best firepower for what the Royal Navy wants at what the Royal Navy thinks is going to be the engagement range that cruisers are going to be fighting. Now, this is a large cruiser. It's got 12 six inch guns in four turrets. It's got plenty of clear space in the center for aircraft operations and Always remember, the town class, the M class, are built around aircraft operations. Do you mean the cruisers became the status ships? Yes, the cruisers did become the status ships. I'll get in more as this is going on, but if you cannot build battleships, if you cannot build aircraft carriers, if you can't really build the ships which are the traditional status ships, the cruisers, the ones which were the step below, become the status ships. Which is what makes this decision to go for a six-inch gun cruiser so strange. And then the Royal Navy are even more cunning. Because the Royal Navy knows what they're building is a surface raider. It's got long-range fuel, it's got good armour, and by having six-inch guns, it drops enough weight that it can all do all this in a well-balanced platform. But there's a problem. The Royal Navy can't build surface raiders and the Royal Navy can't look like it wants to build surface raiders because that's going to look bad. People are going to get scared. Ah, uh, the 8 inch cruiser, yes, to an extent, not a battle cruiser role, but it does certainly start to fulfill uh, the armoured cruiser role. But we're, um, we'll get into this more at the end. I'm just going to finish this slide quickly while I remember what I did. <laughs> Sorry, it was done in 2017 originally, this presentation, so my brain can is do, do, remembering it. So, the 8-inch cruiser and 6-inch cruiser, these ones were well-balanced ships. They are well-organised, they are well-designed, and the picture again for this appears on Twitter. It will be going out as a tweet in a, in a couple minutes. Just in case any of the pictures didn't show up, I arranged it for them to display on the, my Twitter account in sort of order. Anyway, so the Royal Navy is building these ships to go around the world. They have very much emphasis on air power, on their air power generation. In fact, their original template is looking for four aircraft with two carried in stowage. Then it goes down to three aircraft and two in stowage. Their final outfit is two aircraft and two theoretically stowed. Um, but it does work. And they are supposed to go round the world. They're supposed to provide presence around the world. They're supposed to provide this surface radar capability. But the Royal Navy, of course, can't claim it wants to be surface radars. It can't claim it wants to do these things. And it does. So it goes around a sort of clever way. They start off being as the M class. But as the M class, they could get cancelled. No one cares about the Minotaur class. It has had nothing. So Henderson changes them to the town class. Whilst at the same time, Chatfield, Richmond, all these people, that Chatfield's the first sea lord. Richmond is an admiral who's a well-known historian at the time and spends a lot of time talking. Um, basically are slamming these big cruisers, saying, oh, no, no, we shouldn't be building big light cruisers. And Henderson knows they, they're going to talk about it. Uh, but he frankly doesn't care. He wants them built. And he knows no one's going to cancel a town class cruiser. 
I'm not going to say anything, but has anyone noticed that the Type 26 class, which are being ordered so far in advance, are called the City class? Anyone think anyone's going to cancel an HMS Glasgow? Uh, same thing going on here in the 1930s. Because what the Royal Navy needed for its way of war was these large light cruisers, these large six inch cruisers. But what all the politicians were looking at was the size of the guns going, but they're not eight inch cruisers and you're building a 10,000 ton cruiser, the same as eight inch. What's the point of it? And um, we can't understand it because all we can see is the size of the gun. The Royal Navy had their reasoning and it worked. And as I said, once I've got through the slides, I have an up to the date. I've taken it out of this one and it didn't work when I put it in. Um, but I have kept an up to date running tally of as I've gone through of, crew, of ship designs of their guns and the amount of firepower they can get to certain ranges in certain times and I'm going to go through that and explain that at the end and that filters into why the Royal Navy was going for six inch versus eight inch. Yes, same logic for HMS Queen Elizabeth Prince of Wales. Uh, you named them before, uh, far, uh, far enough in advance, they can't cancel them. Yes, so what the Royal Navy needs to do is start naming Albion, Bulwark and Argus's replacements uh, and name them loudly. But we'll leave that to one side. That's modern stuff and I promised I won't do too much of that because I promised I will do something jointly with the Simsec UK President Chris Stockdale Garbutt as a joint effort. Now, Originally, in the 1930s, the Royal Navy had them based around the world as so. They had the second cruiser squadron at home, which was Southampton, Newcastle, Sheffield, Glasgow, Belfast and Edinburgh joining in 1939. So they had six of the class sitting in home waters, ready to deploy. But Belfast and Edinburgh were brand new. They were supposed to go out to the Far East. They hadn't yet gone because they were still being built up and worked up and honestly Nazi Germany was mucking around so frankly they were keeping them back. And they got involved in the Spanish Civil War. One of them got bombed twice in the Spanish Civil War. Home defence, trade and protection uh, and various combined operation exercises and by gum did they do some exercises. I'll be going into one in a second. Exactly as it comes. Exercise CD. Now Exercise CD is one of my most favourite exercises and it's a really cool one because it's basically the Royal Navy proving A, that it has very good surface raiders it's bought and B, what a problem surface raiders are going to be and C, how it's going to deal. It has a whole fleet involved trying to stop the raw, uh, these surface raiders from getting out. The surface raiders are all town class cruisers. There are four of them. <laughs> free get through to the Atlantic. Uh, in, fair, in, in various times, they sort of do go through the exercise in different ways. And this is one of the exercises. This is the July one. And in this one, HMS Southampton manages to go slow, using her aircraft to avoid the rest of the Royal Navy fleet, which is trying to hunt it, avoiding them very, very carefully. And gets all the way up to here. And they've been chasing it all the way around. There are other ones where they just do all sorts of things to get around. At one point, um, HMS, uh, I think it's HMS Sheffield, flashes a signal claiming to be, uh, please do not disturb her because um, it, she's not a Royal Navy ship, she's a German warship. And she flashes that in the exercise. She claims to be a German warship and manages to get past the RAF scout plane. It worked. And as in the exercise, she was pretending to be a German warship and they still let her past. Life happens. So they also go on a royal visit to Canada. The Royal Navy are sending the Royal Family to Canada to do a nice visit, to look prim and proper, and to do some diplomacy. The British government and the Royal Navy to take them out there. Two town class cruisers are sent as escorts. So, they are going on a lovely 
large ocean liner. They're being well looked after, all these things. They have two of the brand new, newest cruisers as escorts. Now, yes, there is a status thing, and yes, you can say all uh, of the potentials, but if you want any proof of how serious the Royal Navy is taking the threat of war in 1939, there's the fact that they're two of their newest, two of their best cruisers. Two cruisers which they need for essential operations elsewhere in the world are deployed to protect the royal family because they're that worried about what the Germans might do. They're that worried about what kind of destabilization operations might be taking place. And before anyone starts to think, oh, the Royal Navy didn't think like that, A, the Royal Navy are paranoid, B, their question to themselves when they're paranoid is, are they paranoid enough? And just checking the timings. Uh, yes, about rifle and time. And that is one of my favourite pictures. And I don't think this picture came from National Archives. I have found this picture of National Archives, Churchill Archives. And I tried to get into the Royal Archives to get their pictures. Because they have even more in there. But I haven't managed to get into the Royal Archives yet. I probably should write a letter to Prince Philip. Right. So, four squadron, East India. East. Now, this is the squadron sitting in the Indian Ocean, and they have very specific duties. Now, what I love is you can find some of these duties listed out in the National Archives and their reports and the stuff they're getting up to. And so this is the duties of HMS Manchester and what she's getting up to. On Saturday, 20th of March... Um, she did a consumption trial of 27 knots to check her engines were working properly in the heat. Uh, sent an officer in shore in touch to, to get in touch with a local agent. And, and Mr. Sangrat Ree of the Indian Medical Department came aboard to see me at 11.15. He himself had only been on the island a fortnight and was not expecting a visit. The only communication he had to the world for Naquari is a steamer from Port Blair twice a year and an occasional trading vessel. I very much the only... British presence on this island was a, in, uh, a doctor from the Indian Medical Department and, well, I presume a doctor, uh, and a visit from a Royal Navy cruiser coming and dropping in. On Wednesday 29th of March, two aircraft were sent to search the southern half of the islands for Japanese fishing boats. One licensed one was seen in the Ritchie Archipelago and one showing no number or flag on the west coast. Again, this is what we now consider ocean, ocean, uh, what ocean patrol vessels would be doing. It's economic, exclusive economic zone patrols, all these things. This is what the Royal Navy is getting up to. This is what they're doing. And they're very good at it. And that's what they're having to do. But also, please note, they're still doing this job. These jobs are not new and they've been going on. And in the 1930s, the Royal Navy was doing this in the Indian Ocean with a cruiser. There are probably a fair number of OPV officers who, if they're watching this, are thinking, ha, ah, so it used to be I would have 12 six-inch guns for this job. Now I have a 30 millimeter cannon. I think I need an upgrade. You know, used to be. They could just buy 12 six-inch guns for the job. And... On Thursday, they took some troops ashore. Um, the officer commanding troops, Major Spencer North Hampshire Regiment, picked up a game of football every day for the men. Yes, again, noting they had soldiers aboard who were not from the Royal Marines. There weren't always enough Royal Marines, and quite a lot of the army often liked fulfilling the job in on cruisers. So sometimes you'd have Marines, sometimes you'd have cruisers. Sometimes, as on this particular ship, you had a, sec a detachment of the army and you had a detachment of Royal Marines aboard because they were the only ship in the region. Because, well, they were the only ships. There were three of them, Manchester, Liverpool and Gloucester, all going around the region. All wandering around the East Indies. These three ships were the ships in the region. They needed the extra troops for doing their policing ashore, for doing their presence ashore. And so the army rounded them up. And then we have <laughs> what I tend to call the Wild East. 
HRS Birmingham had got out to here. She was out in the China station with four county class cruisers. Dorsetshire, Kent, Cornwall and Suffolk. So this is a really big station. And this is something where you start to realise the importance of the towns. Because up until now, the China station has been the county station. It's been their station because they need to face off against the Japanese. They need to face off against the Americans. They need to try and keep these two from fighting a war and to keep them in peace. You therefore, if you're going to do that, if you're the, third, if you're the major naval power, you need your big presence. That's a big thing saying we're deploying HMS Birmingham. That's basically telling the world, right, these ships are going to be our big presence. And you're going to have to deal with them. How many troops do they sail with? A lot. Um, I think she had at one point, and going back to the Indian Ocean, I think uh, Manchester at one point was carrying about 120 army soldiers and about 80 marines in her complement which was quite a heavy load. Um, she had those because there had been a lot of Japanese instigations in the area and they were basically worried about finding a little island in, in, the, in the Indian Ocean which had suddenly got a Japanese flag on it. Basically, the Royal Navy was stopping the Japanese doing what the Chinese had done in the South China Sea today. So again, people look at the South China Sea and they go, oh, China's doing something new. They're taking over these little islands and they're building them up into you know, these island, bigger islands and they're turning them into bases and honestly, A, it's nothing new and B, it's nothing that hasn't been worried about or dealt with in the past. The problem is that the Chinese have actually managed to do it. Yes, a solid company. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, a, a solid company definitely of some kind. So, what do you have HMS Birmingham, this wonderful ship, I'm not sure if you can see her. Again, her picture will be coming up online. Um... What was she getting up to in 1939? What was going on? Well, for those who've seen an episode on Tsingtao, you'll know. Uh, I'm not sure if Tsingtao has actually had a video. I might not have done the video on Tsingtao. I know I've done all sorts of articles, and I will put a link in here eventually to the articles of the Global Maritime History site. But I'm not sure if I have actually done a video for Tsingtao now thinking about it. I did do little videos, but I don't think I've done a big video. Might have to rectify that with another special. So, Singtao incident in 1939. I know when good guys go bad has a lot of stuff about Singtao. So, the Japanese take a British merchant steamer, the SS Vincent de Paul, uh, which has been trading probably where it shouldn't have, up some rivers it shouldn't have been in, near a war zone, and they take it into custody. The Royal Navy can't allow that to happen. Um, HMS Birmingham had a different shape bow from the other towns because the Royal Navy was experimenting. If you're building enough of the class of ships, you do tend to muck around. And the Royal Navy was trying to work out what was the most efficient bow shape. And if you can are building enough ships, you can do some test models and that, and then you can go, right then, we'll build one of this class, see what it's like, and see if it works. Interestingly enough, the Birmingham bow gets slightly modified and becomes the Crown Colony class bow. So, you know, it does come along. Anyway, so she's in the Far East. She's in China Station. The SS Vincent de Paul, the British merchant ship, gets taken by the Japanese. She takes taken to Tsingtao, where she's sitting under the guns of three Japanese cruisers. Three heavy cruisers. Now, Three heavy cruisers are a bit of a powerful. They've got eight inch guns. They are massive. Captain Brind, who is HMS Birmingham's commanding officer, sails in. His orders are to get the SS Vince and the Paul out. And they do. Basically, he sails in. He tries to do it by diplomacy. He goes and chats and goes, you know, you will release the ship to us. You will release the ship to us. Seeing them very polite. No, no, no. So he then goes back to his ship. He puts a party under a sub-lieutenant aboard the SS Vincent de Paul, and he basically goes, right, we're sailing in the morning. The Japanese do try and board the ship. The sub-lieutenant is a sub-lieutenant Ashworth who tells them to, not, uh, in the nicest way, bog off. Uh, you're not getting aboard the ship. 
and they sail out. The Japanese point their big 8-inch guns at HMS Birmingham. So, she is facing off against 24 8-inch guns. Captain Prind orders her the turrets to each focus on the bridge of these cruisers and the fourth turret to focus on the Japanese ashore headquarters. There's also a little sloop at the front which swivels her four inch pop pop round and you have got to give big pluses up to that little sloop command, uh, that little sloop's commander because let's be honest, if you've got a single open air four inch gun and you are gamefully pointing it at ships which have eight inch guns and heavy armour, you are brave. Stupid possibly, but brave. They don't swivel round the torpedoes. But, interesting enough, Bryn does order them uncovered, so they are ready to swivel out. If, uh, you know, in nicest way, they're at such close range, their actual fear is the torpedoes won't arm in time before they hit them, so... That's the main reason why they're not pointing them around, but he takes the cubs off so the Japanese know they'll put torpedoes in the water. And so they sail out. This is what was looking at them. Three of these Ashigara class. Huge, mountainous, battle fighting, eight inch heavy cruisers. The sort of things which the Japanese went, ah, yeah. which the Americans went, oh, and which everyone else went, oh, you win the top trumps. They do win the top trumps, but they're scared of that. The reason they're scared of that is they don't want to start a war. And the Royal Navy's plan is always that in the nicest way, if you end up in a war, this is not going to be fighting that. This is going to be fighting carrier aircraft and a battleship. If it's fighting that, it's going to be fighting a pack of them. And they're going to be using torpedoes. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it is... Yeah, I have to say, when I saw the incident last year with Iran and the various issues we've had with Iran still going on, it has brought back a lot of this memory and a lot of the stuff to do, which is why I've done so many presentations recently on international maritime law and on Singtel. It really is quite relevant, because when I did this first in 2017, one of the questions in the, uh, that I was given was, what is the point in studying this as it will never happen again? No one will ever disobey international laws and take ships hostage. I'm not omniscient. I'm, I'm not a you know visionary or anything like that. I'm just dealing with human nature. And the odds are, if people have done it in the past, they're going to do it again, because humanity hasn't evolved that much. What is interesting here is the Royal Navy managed to get away with it. When that Iranian tanker was seized, when the British tanker was seized by the Iranians, the problem the British had with that is that they couldn't get there in time to stop it. Every other time they've been able to get there in time to stop it. But the moment the Iranians have put troops aboard the ship, if you're going to try and prevent it happening, getting and taking place, prevent it getting taken to Iran, you have to board your own troops. And that's going to be a fighting battle. And... Britain doesn't want to get into that. It had no power in place to force that ship to hand over. And that is the problem. That is the sort of scenario you're dealing with. Because you don't want to sink the ship. You don't want to look the bad guys. Because you have to deal with the rules of engagement you have now. Yeah, that is to an extent. You know, Birmingham going in and facing against these guys. They know if they shoot on her, they're starting a war with Britain. They don't want to start a war with Britain. I would point out that the Iranians obviously don't want to start a war with Britain either because they haven't fired on the warships. They've gone jolly close. They've done lots of things, but they haven't fired on the warships. They did it when the warship wasn't there, when the warship couldn't get there because the warship had been dealing with incidents at the other end and then it was racing back to deal with this one. So basically, you had one warship there in one place and it couldn't be in both places. With this incident, the Royal Navy has four cruisers out at the current South China Sea. But still, the, S uh, the Birmingham, to get there in time, cracks on at 34 knots. 
In fact, at one point, her engineers reckon she's doing as many as 36 or more knots because she's literally straining her engine so to get there on time. And she steams in less than 24 hours, uh, no, almost immediately as the SS Vincent of the Paul is putting down her anchor, they see Birmingham arriving in the outer harbour. That is how, from them, them getting information, how quickly she steams. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's the Queen Elizabeth class are the forthcoming battle group. But again, there's a problem with that. We've only got two. Now, if you're replacing Ocean, Albion and Bulwark three for three with LHDs, which all had ski ramps, then you could say, well, we can guarantee a amphibious task group and we can guarantee a carrier battle group because we have five ships with flight decks and three, uh, and three ships with landing uh, with docks so therefore we can always have exact we can always guarantee to have something available we don't have that amount we might we might get that but it's going to require some arguing so unfortunately war begins and what does the royal navy immediately have to do well you have second cruiser squadron so goes to the humber force and they have southampton and glasgow then there's the 18th Cruiser Squadron. They become part of the Enforcement Force with some Tribal-class destroyers and some F-class destroyers and some battleships up at the um, Scarpa Flow, ready to kill any German task group who try and tries to make it to the Atlantic. And then the East Indies. Manchester transferred to home. Liverpool transferred to China Station, then heads home. Gloucester transferred to Mediterranean. Birmingham transferred to Mediterranean and sent for an engine refit. So this is what you end up very by quickly by July 1940. What has happened? The whole class. They're suddenly back in Europe and in the Mediterranean. The Royal Navy's had to completely reorientate itself. And partially this is because they haven't got enough new ships to do the fighting. They're doing the best they can, but they haven't got enough. So they've had to call home, because they've taken losses, the town class. So the town class aren't doing what they're doing. Now, remember, these ships were built with the capabilities to be surface raiders. And this is the very nice iron brew, which my lovely girlfriend has given me. Um, and they were built like that to threaten the Japanese, to basically make the point that, in the nicest way, you go to all of us, we're going to start off the economic war straight away. We're going to start smashing your trade straight away, and then eventually the battle fleet is going to arrive. The British deterrence against Japan, therefore, wasn't one of our battle fleets going to fight your battle fleet. It was our cruisers are going to destroy your economy and then our battle fleet's going to arrive and fight your battle fleet. That was their deterrence. You don't want to do this because it's going to be hell for you. That's the trouble, though, when the Royal Navy eventually sends battleships out there, when they send out... Prince of Wales, when they send out Repulse, they, they, they send these ships out, and... If you're sending out only two cattle ships, it shows you can only send out two cattle ships. It's an omission of weakness. You have to think that Cunningham wouldn't have advised it, Pound didn't want it, Henderson certainly wouldn't advise it. These things, it, wa it wasn't sendable. Sending, sending out your biggest, most powerful ships is great when you can send out a sizable fleet. If they'd been able to send out a squadron, which is four or five of these ships, that would have been a sign of strength. But sending out two? Two is a case of... Huh? In the nicest way, the Japanese Navy can destroy. That's basically, you've told, you're facing off against the Japanese equivalent of the German Risk Fleet. And you've done exactly what the German High Seas Fleet always wanted. You've sent out a penny packet of the Grand Fleet that they can defeat, and that will reduce the Grand Fleet strength. It's the same here. You're sending out two ships, which shows you're weak, and gives enough they can take out, and they can start removing your numbers. It's, it's not good deterrence. Deterrence was the cruisers. Deterrence was the economic warfare threat. Deterrence was the carrier. Battleships were deterrence. Battleships, only two of them were a sign of weakness. Sorry, I will get off my hobby horse. So, what are they getting up to in war? Well, this is one of my favourite examples of what the cruisers get up to. 
And this, of course, is a pursuit of the Bismarck. Now, the Bismarck operation is always interesting to me for two reasons. One, you have the tribal class destroyers steaming up from Africa to get involved. Um, basically, they leave their convoy down here, crank on full speed, and go kunk, kunk, kunk. Uh, and you have town-class cruisers all over the place doing it. First thing you have is this lovely barrier operation, right? So you have a barrier which is done of two layers of merchant cruisers. That's liners converted to with some few guns to a cruiser. And that's actual proper cruisers. And it goes HMS Birmingham, HMS Man uh, if I remember correctly, HMS Manchester and Arafusia, which is, of course, not a town class, a little cruiser. And this is off the coast of Iceland. And they are left there. Even when Bismarck is doing all its stuff around here, they're still up there. Why? Because more might come after Bismarck and they don't want them getting through. Now, Edinburgh and Sheffield are involved all the way along and down through here and you can't really see it but these attacks by Edinburgh by Sheffield getting involved in the fight actually distract the Bismarck they, the Bismarck realizes it's completely surrounded it's got the battleships on one side but it's got these cruisers and again because of the size of the town class cruisers, the reports are that the Bismarck, when they're, the crew are thinking, they're thinking they were surrounded by a pack of counties. Which might sound strange, but if you consider how HMS London and other counties were reconstructed, you can start to see the reconstructed counties versus the town class cruisers actually get quite similar. Now, I'm hoping there are some of my particular friends who are obsessed with the Mediterranean watching today, because this one will be interesting. This, of course, is HMS Manchester involved in the Battle of Cape Spartavento. Spartavento is one of those fun battles where um, everyone gets a bit surprised when I say it, because it happened on 27th of November, 1940. But, but, Taranto, I hear you say, that stopped the Italian Navy coming out of the sea, that destroyed the Italian Navy. And actually, we wish it did. Uh, it did. It did do a lot of damage to the Italian Navy, and it did stop doing a lot. But you have to remember, what a Navy tends to react when it's been beaten up in harbour like that is they redouble their efforts at sea, because they have to try and get back momentum. They have to get try and get back their power. So the Italian Navy is going to sea as much as they can. Hmm? Interest intensifies. Ah, yes. So... 20, there have been also, in this period, in fact, in the end of 1940, there are all sorts of running battles. This is a, one of those battles which is an interesting one because there are keep going convoys. And again, I want to just put this out there. The Battle of Taranto is part of an, is an effort to carry, uh, to cover a convoy. Convoys going backwards and across the Mediterranean. HMS Ark Royal is launching her own strike on Italy. Illustrious was supposed to be joined by Eagle to attack Taranto. The whole plan was if it destroyed the Italian battle fleet, great. If it just distracted them, that's fine as well. The whole point was to get the convoys through. So, yes, it did great. Woohoo, we're very happy. But we're even more happy we got the convoys through. That was the purpose of the operation. Italians notice, and they keep attacking convoys, and the convoys keep getting into battles. This particular convoy ends uh, has an escort, which is uh, Newcastle, Sheffield, Southampton, and Berwick, a county-class cruiser. It's got lots of destroyers. It's got two battleships. That's a major escort for a convoy, which is supposedly going through an area where the enemy fleet has been destroyed. And they get into a fight, and... The Royal Navy ships get damaged. The Italian ships get damaged. Battleships exchange gunfire. All sorts of things happen. Spartavento is quite a major battle, but it really doesn't go the Royal Navy's way entirely. 
they win because they get the convoy through. The, they lose, though, because the Italians actually managed to steal a bit of an advance on them. And you can see this is fight because they're being straddled. Okay. And Spartavento is sort of this kind of interesting operation. Again, I think this map will go up on Twitter. And you can see the Italian Navy coming in and the Royal Navy is going along. The convoy is going along down here. The Basically, the covering force goes up to protect it. You've got the cruisers going up, all the Royal Navy warships going up to make sure they are well between the Italian attacking force and the convoy. That's the point of the Royal Navy. They're trying to get the convoy through. And for those who know the battle under another name, and please excuse my very bad Italian, because my very bad Italian will be coming out very shortly, I made sure to write it down in my notes. You're dealing with dyslexic here. So dyslexic writes it down in his notes. Cape Teluda, I think, the Battle of Cape Teluda, and it is a cool battle, <laughs> but it's also one of the ones which carry, which takes a real beating for both sides. What the Royal Navy learns out of this battle, though, is actually far more interesting than what the Italian Navy. The Italian Navy goes out and goes like, oh yes, we can still fight, hooray. The Royal Navy comes back and goes, what were we missing? We didn't have enough carrier air power. We didn't have enough scouting out. We were relying entirely on RAF air, air reconnaissance. And so they change it. And this is how... Yes, you can follow the slides on my Twitter. Um, there are pictures going up there. The Royal Navy basically learns this, and this is how the Royal Navy develops its, its operations in the Mediterranean. From now on, after this point, convoys always have a carrier with them. They always have their own air reconnaissance up. They always are doing it. Now, you think, why was the Royal Navy not doing it beforehand? Well, the Royal Navy wasn't always doing it beforehand because air operations require a lot of radio communications. They require signals to go up. You have beacons. You have all sorts of things you have to go on, which can reveal your position. The Royal Navy prefers to try and sneak through convoys on a mission of silence. So they're trying to do it without it. Once they learn they can't, then they work out a way to do it with. But they're always trying to get away with it. Um, HMS Gloucester, one of the town class, of course, is sunk at Crete. And one of the interesting points <laughs> that I found when reading the notes about Gloucester was that uh, the Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Hugh Singer remarks about it. My first impression when I entered the water was that it was agreeably warm. But I soon found that the water which is pleasant for bathing is not necessarily a suitable medium in which to spend a day and a night. That's a Royal Navy officer. But that's also a Royal Navy officer is Cunningham's response, which was, it takes the Navy three years to build a ship. It will take 300 years to build a new tradition. The evacuation will continue. Here's the thing. There is often a bait of what ships he's discussing when he says this. There are only one type of ships which take three years to build. Destroyers take 18 months to two years. Battleships were talking about five years. Cruisers are the only ones which are about three years at this time. And when I'm talking about three years from their starting construction to their end of construction and entering service. So he's talking about cruisers. And they do lose ships. Now, of course, and anyone who's ever watched me talking about the Far East war plans, and I have got some, uh, one talks coming up is on the global war, the Royal Navy's plans for global wars. You'll have heard me saying that the pre-war plans have been 4th Squadron, that's the East Indies Squadron, reinforcing 5th Squadron, which is the China Squadron, on Singapore, and fanning out from there to be a scourge of the Japanese economic strength, basically going out over their trade and destroying them. That didn't happen. That didn't happen at all, of course, because they were called back. So, actually... The Royal Navy's forced to withdraw on Singapore. 
the Japanese, instead of having to deploy ships to try and find Royal Navy surface raiders, are able to concentrate their forces, push in, and instead of the Royal Navy being able to take out that, Singapore falls. However, HMS Newcastle is one of the first ships to return to the Far East when the Royal Navy starts to really push back there in 1943. And is eventually joined by others, Belf including Belfast, and they served the Pacific and they did excellently. They really did show how good a design they were out there. They were really very, very useful. And this is the background of it, the whole way through that I've been talking about. And the background, as you can see, is where the Japanese trade goes. Why is this important? Why is it important that 61 ships are going to Vancouver with 12 more ships in Canada? That uh, 10 ships are on the direct route from Yokohama to San Francisco? 9 ships from Honolulu to Yokohama? All these things. Well, this actually comes from a file which directly links into the M-Class file. I.e. the two files reference each other. So if you need any proof that the Royal Navy was building their ships as service raiders, there's the fact that the file which designs the M-Class links to a file which specifically lists the exact number of trade, uh, trade uh, ships the Japanese have on specific trade routes, where they are, and what they're going to be hunted down for. And by the way, the Royal Navy worked out that the Tan-Class vessels could, with a suitable supply ship, put in this area, be operating all the way up here, taking out Japanese supplies in the middle of the ocean. Which, by the way, if you want to look up another incident on the when good guys go bad, you'll see I talk about the Asamamaru incident, which is when HMS Liverpool, a town class cruiser again, I wonder why she was sent on this mission, takes out, uh, tracks down the Asamamaru, which is the Japanese equivalent of the Queen Elizabeth, the pride of the fleet in terms of its liners, about here, right next to Japan, and goes, you have German prisoners aboard, a German merchant seaman aboard, we're going to take them off you now. No, 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 we're a neutral ship. Anyway, it's a whole thing, and I would enjoy, invite you to go have a look at it. I will now swing you round to the laptop, because I'm going to discuss some gun firing with you. Do apologise, you're about to see me do some gymnastics to get over that. Dun 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 dun! Yep! Yeah. Oi! Oi! Bang! Oi! Ah, uh, apologies. Right then. We're round. Ah! Oh. And back. <sighs> and I didn't break the board. That was close. So, hopefully this exits quickly. And I can go to my Excel spreadsheet. Now, the Excel spreadsheet, if for those of you who are looking at it, is a list of all the Royal Navy's cruisers and what they can do. Now you'll notice the county class cruiser has the advantage because it can get the most weight of fire to 18 kilometers, which is the Royal Navy's working out fighting range for cruiser actions and for, uh, for in one minute. So it can get 3.94 tons. But if we look down, it's this class down here, which wins every other time up to 10 minutes. And interesting enough, it's supposed to run out of shells if it keeps firing non-stop for, in 26 minutes. And the Battle of Cape Spadavento lasted 54 minutes. And they certainly fired enough shells that it went through more than 26 minutes worth. So this is why my point is that some of the cruisers were carrying more shells. Anyway, that is the town class cruisers. And this is why the Royal Navy was building them. Because the Royal Navy worked out that if you're going to be fighting, especially pre-radar, at distances of 18 kilometers or less, it's what your maximum number of shells and maximum number of ex explosive you're going to get on the enemy that's going to count. And most battles are going to last more than one minute. Most battles are going to last more than one minute. In which case, the town class wins against the county class. Because the town class will, in five minutes, drop 456 shells on an opponent. 
are matched only by the tribal class. But a counter class will drop 192 shells. The spreadsheet is fascinating. It's something I kept, I kept going a long time because... Okay, for those of you who have gone, done archival research, you'll understand this. And for those who don't, I'm going to explain it. When you go into the archives, not all the records are kept. Okay? The National Archives has billions of records, but not all have been kept. Oh! Hopefully it hasn't gone. Uh, yeah, sorry, hopefully it's back. <sighs> Hello? Is it working in? Is it working? <laughs> hopefully. Um, sorry, uh, while well, in my action movement, I managed to knock the power supply out of the phone and the phone had lost power. Sorry. <laughs> Too much action work. Anyway, so. When you're building these cruisers, when you're doing all this, you need to think about what you're going to be doing and fighting, how you're going to be fighting them. Six inch cruiser works for the Royal Navy for what they're going to do. And the tribal, uh, town class can get far more firepower on target than the t uh, counties could or the other ships could. Yeah, critical hit on the phone, definitely. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, but they do look rather cool and they do of course evolve into the crown colonies and all the others so while we're looking at town class cruisers why do they matter why does economic warfare matter why, what's the royal navy looking at well the royal navy is looking at all these things because the royal navy wants to keep peace they wanted to work out how to deter war and that's something which we need to start thinking about now because the trouble is, with the metrics we use on current warships, we're always looking at their war fighting capability. We don't look at their peace fighting capability. Peace fighting is about presence. Peace fighting is about looking good. Honestly, there are problems when you have warships going around the world which look mucky. And by the way, Harold, hello Gerald, hello Paul from Chicago, hello Sal, thank you for staying with me. Thank you. I do apologize again, all of you, for the uh, <laughs> interrupters of the phone. <laughs> oh. In other news, I think I have <laughs> almost finished off my ambrew. <laughs> Not quite. A little bit left. I don't know. See, this is why I prefer to keep it so that I'm just sitting down and talking. Because with this jury-rigged system... So, you know, we're making do with the phone system and hoping the phone system works. Now, some things I haven't managed to cover, which I would like to have covered in the talk, and I was worried might not show up well on the thing, but I want to get through now. So, this is exercise CD, for those who didn't manage to see it up on the screen up there with my lovely um, portable... I think. Yes, that was actually my ringtone coming through. I think that was my girlfriend calling to check I hadn't hurt myself while I was doing this. She, I, I think she watches these things with slightly bated breath and worrying what's going to come out next. Like my aunt watches to check I haven't yet reached a thousand people. Thank you very much to all those who are now subscribing. I think I was 322 when I last looked and that's frankly amazing and far more than I ever thought I got or I get and it's lovely. Um, the bragging rights pursuit is still ongoing. This is the big map of the war against Japan, the plan for how to fight. Bragging rights in a family are incredibly important. They're worth, it's worth more than gold and money or anything. Um, and you get a real idea of the Royal Navy is thinking about how to fight a whole war. They think about how to fight a global war. Well, I do keep saying thank you to Draken for now. Um, frankly, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. He's a super guy. Uh, they're super. And I love the five minute videos. This is why I'm not doing five minute videos. Why mine are closer to an hour and a half, 90 minutes to two hours. Again, the M class. Now, 
these are very well designed warships for what you need. And remember, what the Royal Navy is spending a lot of time in, by going for six inch guns again, the turrets are lighter, the guns are lighter, the ammunition's lighter, gives you a lot of weight within the treaty system that you can use for other things. And they do use them, shamelessly, for other things. The Battle of Cape Spartavento. Again, these will all be on Twitter in colour, so please go look at them, please go download them. And it's an incredibly interesting battle. And I've got a write-up on global maritime history about this battle as well, where I've gone through the files that the Royal Navy has in the National Archives. Here you go, the commands again. And this, of course, is the Royal Navy fleet that never was, that was dreamed of but never was. Again, town class are important for that. But it's also important to understand that the Royal Navy... ...are looking at these things and going, what are we building it for? That's the interesting thing I find, and that's the thing that attracted me to the town class and why I was doing this whole presentation back in 2017. Everyone else was building 8-inch cruisers. Everyone else was obsessing about the heavy cruisers. The Royal Navy was looking at the 6-inch cruisers. Now, you can say that's one of two things. You can say that's British exceptionalism, an ego. Or you can say it's Britain looking at what's in its own needs, what does best suit its interests. And that's what nations need to do. This is what actually, along with a town class, has drawn me to really get annoyed when I see people doing ship-to-ship -ship comparisons and they're going, oh, this ship is better than this ship in a top trumps way because this one has more guns or this one has more armour or this one's faster. It's lovely. Top trumps. Yay. Happy day. But the actual question you need to ask is which ship better suits the nation it serves needs. With the town-class cruisers, the Royal Navy had the ships it needed to serve its own needs. It had ships which were capable of being all-round fighters. They were capable of surface raiders. If you can see, uh, see the six-inch guns perform at River Plate versus the Grass Bay, they do pretty well there. I know there are lots of fans of the Grass Bay, that particular heavy cruiser, which is much loved, that claim that it was only damaged by the eight-inch guns. No. Fair, the Uruguayan reports are very clear on this fact. When you read through them, damage they're listing could not have all been done by the eight-inch guns. There is A, too much damage there, and Exeter wasn't firing for long enough, and B, the damage isn't necessarily in the right place for it to all been done from the angle of Exeter. So it has to have been done by the 6-inch. So remember, the 6-inch gets close enough, it's going to bash you to pieces as well. And secondly, and this is the important thing in the town class, when they do get into a fight, they really do kick. And that's the important thing. And as I said, at within five minutes, they could have 456 shells on the enemy. And within 10 minutes, 936. If you're firing 936 at an enemy and you've got a, let's say, 10% chance of scoring a direct hit, you've hit them with 93 shells, 94 shells. If you're a county, you've fired 392 shells. You've hit them with 33, 39. It's not enough. Um, I would also go for the cruisers. Let's see. Uh, great point, six inch cruisers. I .e. Bismarck is impressed. Germany didn't need U boats. Germany needed a better strategic position. Yes, U boats were useful. They were certainly more useful. But if the G uh, Germans had ever been able to mount a proper task force into the Atlantic, i.e., they'd had the destroyers necessary to push a battleship and a carrier and cruisers into the Atlantic, the Royal Navy would have been in absolute hell. That was the Royal Navy's nightmare, a German task force getting into the Atlantic. Not a German single surface raider, that was doable. A German carrier and battleship, that would have been a nightmare. But <clears throat> there was this little battle called Narvik, actually technically the third battle of Narvik. First battle of Narvik is the Norwegian defence of the harbour. Then this is the second battle, where the H-class flotilla of the Royal Navy get beaten up. And then there is the third battle, 
of Narvik, where the Royal Navy Fleet Commander goes in an HMS War Sprite to try and restrain the Tribal Class Destroyers, who've been buddies of the people in the H Class and have been working with them previously, from massacring the Germans. And when I say massacring, the example I give is HMS Eskimo, which charges around a fjord, loses her bow, continues, uh, loses A turret, continues firing B turret, tur fire, continues firing her, tor turns, continues her turn to fire her torpedoes, and then completes her turn and advances stern first, firing X and Y turrets at the Germans until they ran themselves into the beach to get away from her. That is what happens at Narvik. Narvik is one of those beautiful battles to read about because it literally, it could be a cartoon in some of the things. It is, battle, second battle of Narvik goes every way the Germans want it. It is, for them, it's textbook success. The third battle of Narvik destroys so much of the German destroyer strength and most importantly kills so many of their better and more experienced officers that it basically takes out the German Navy's destroyer force as a, a reliable force for much of the war. Taranto is supposed is given the myth of taking out the Italian Navy for the World War II. It doesn't. We all know that. But Narvik does. The German Navy was in part built to take on the... Well, no. The German Navy was officially being built to take on the Russians at one point, but it was always about being able to balance off against the British. You know, if you're going for global power, Britain's the preeminent global power. They're the ones who stand in your way. You have to be able to find a way to balance that against them. So the Germans keep going through variations of what the French tried in the Napoleonic Wars. And it's not wrong to say that they are being silly of that, but it's, it, they're destroying. So, Gerald, you're not wrong. They were officially, that's what they were doing. And realistically, they were never going to be able to fight the Royal Navy in a traditional battle. They're always looking for an offset strategy. Remember what I've said about the Royal Navy taking on the Japanese. The Royal Navy were looking to use economic warfare to deter the Japanese, to try and stop them. They were trying to use the town class cruisers as this economic warfare deterrent. You go to war with us, we will take out your trade and then our battle fleet will turn up. Sort of thing. You will spend so much time trying to hunt down our cruisers, you won't ever get to be able to attack Singapore. And by the time you get round to, you've found our cruisers, the battle fleet will be at Singapore and you'll be crying. That was the Royal Navy's plan. The German plan was similar. You had surface raiders to distract the Royal Navy around the world. That's what the Deutschland class were going to do. They were going to be down the South Atlantic, the North Atlantic. They would have loved to have another cruiser sitting in the Indian Ocean, probably, doing something similar to the Grass Bay, causing trouble. And if they'd been used properly and used far more aggressively and by far more experienced seamen, they might well have caused a lot more trouble than they did. Um, there's a whole series on the Battle of the River Plate. Please go have a look at it. It's quite a cool series, and I've done it on this. The, the, it's often these videos. It was pre-recorded videos rather than live ones, though. The whole thing that they're planning is trying to offset the Royal Navy strength. And so the Royal Navy are planning on how to offset the Japanese strength. And then you find the German Navy are planning similar things against the Royal Navy back in the in the North Atlantic. And you sort of, you look at it, these are navies adjusting to their different powers. The Royal Navy is the world's most powerful navy, but they realise they can't be the most powerful navy everywhere all the time. So some of the time they're going to be weak. So that's why they train to fight at night. That's why they think about using air power and long range strikes. That's why they're using cruisers for economic warfare because of their weakness in terms of they can't be strong everywhere. The Germans are not able to build up to a strength for which they can challenge the Royal Navy one for one in a traditional battle fleet action. So they have to build it up to challenge them in a different way. And they're doing it via this, by building up a force which can offset it. So it's U-boats, it's cruisers, it's a whole force that they need to build. But the trouble is the German Navy is looked at, it wasn't going to reach strength for even what it was supposed to be until about 1944 probably, possibly 1945. I.e. Hitler went to war six years too early for the Navy. Arguably eight to ten years too early for the Navy, because honestly, there is a difference between having ships and being able to use ships. 
the Royal Navy had the advantage in that it had such a train, uh, such a large trained body of personnel that the moment ships came into service, it could put enough experienced personnel and it could use them. But it takes a while if you don't have that body experience to build it up. Yes. A lot of thought was putting into use of Tint Towns that way. The towns had a lot of idea about using their aircraft for various operations. Remember, their original plan had been to carry about four or five. And no, Gerald, don't apologize. It's, it's welcome to have a question. Um, four or five, uh, so for four, say one, their original idea had been four or five cruisers, uh, four or five aircraft aboard each of the cruisers. Um, eventually it goes down to about three, usually with, and not, with up to two in stowage for long range operations. And it wasn't going to be a long range strike. But again, don't think of it in terms of attacking enemy cruisers. Think of it in terms of attacking merchant ships. And think of it again in terms of the Royal Navy. So, German Navy attacking merchant ships in the South Atlantic, as the Graf Spee does it, is very diplomatic, very polite. He's taking prisoners, he's stopping the ships, he's checking the papers, all sorts of nice things. Royal Navy going economic warfare versus the Japanese. Remember, this is the Navy which charges up a fjord to get back its, the Yossing Ford to get back its, uh, the British emergency sail uh, prisoners from the uh, Altmark in Norway. Um, I have a feeling those particular aircraft armed with bombs would have been taking out Japanese merchant ships every chance they see them. So they would have been basically magnifying the presence of that cruiser to an even larger range of people, uh, Japanese getting reports of our oh, merchant ship was attacked by this aircraft or was sunk by this aircraft. And this, that, and You can imagine the, basically the Royal Navy going total war to wind up the Japanese and keep them distracted so they couldn't put a fleet together to come and attack Singapore. Because that was how the Royal Navy planned on defending Singapore. Keep the Japanese Navy occupied, far to the north, far away from it, so until the battle fleet arrives. It works, but it didn't get to be done. The town class work continued. Um, it became the Crown Colony class, and then it became the Tigers. Modified. And I do say this modified, but it does continue. The town class design isn't discontinued. It keeps going. I would say that they have a lot of heritage with the British. And there is a reason that the city class are being named the city class. And a lot of those names are continuation of the town class names. So it's going to be interesting. Right then. So, any more questions? Because I realise that I have now kept everyone here for about ooh, an hour and 20 minutes. And I'm not sure whether this will connect the two videos. I'm hoping it will. And the first hour hasn't been lost because of the power shortage. I'd also like to say, if anyone can, please go and have a look at Myrtle Panda. Um, she's a good friend of mine who suffers from Crohn's. Uh, Crown colonies are theoretically st stuffed into an 8,000 ton displacement. Basically, 8,000 tons is what you get when um, a town colony... Uh, basically, a town colony is 8,000 tons is when you take a turret off a town class and you take out the stuff which needed to support that turret. It's amazing once you take out the manpower, once you take out the machinery, once you cut aircraft, once you cut all these things, you it, you get down to roughly an 8,000 ton displacement. Basically, uh, Crown Cunley is a stripped down war build version of a town class. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's good. Thank you, Michael. That saved me from a lot of worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm really get, still getting used to this whole live thing and this whole recording stuff. So, you know, any mistakes, please do blame me. Um, I'm now going to go off. I'm going to load this up and then I'm going to drown myself in my Easter egg. Yes, chocolate. Uh, the Crown Colonies were built with... Ah, right then. So... The Crown Colonies, some of them were built with four turrets, most are built with three turrets, 
and most are rapidly to converted the free turrets because the fourth turret is got rid of in favor of more AA defense, especially 40 millimeters, which are put in for going to the Pacific. Town class are lovely ships. Thank you. Thank you. And have a nice day. And um, I'd just like to say one thing, which I've forgotten so far to say because I've been so worried about this. But thank you to those who are now subscribing and especially to those who are sponsoring me through um, Patreon. Um, it brought a bit of a tear to my eye, I have to admit. I'm always self-funded. I'm an early career researcher. I, For example, sometimes I've got 1,200 students in the room playing £90 for a two hour lecture to the university and I get paid 15 pounds an hour because that's my contract rate. So, you know, that's my life and I fund my own research. It, I'm, it's it really surprised me when someone started funding me on Patreon and when I've been getting funders on that, I, I it completely shocked me. I never expected to get it. I just done it and put it up because Simon Harley had, and he told me I should do just in case. Um, I honestly never thought I'd get anyone interested in funding me. So all this stuff comes from my own funding of the trips and all these things. So thank you very much to everyone who's funding. And thank you very much who's sharing the uh, sharing the stuff and uh, helping me get up bragging rights with my aunt because I do want to get to that thousand just to wind her up. Would the quad turrets have been a good idea? Yes, but... The quad turrets would have been a far more complicated to maintain. They would have required more ballast. And the thing which actually killed them, and this is one of the lesser known things that killed them, is that they looked at the speed profile of how it would affect the town class, and that pissed off Henderson. And he basically said no. So the four inch turret, uh, the four, uh, the quad six inch turrets died that death. Oh, oh, thank you. And thank you, Gerald. And thank you, Draken Fennel. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I do enjoy Draken Fennel's um, five minutes on some of the ships. And I hope you guys enjoy my 90 minutes to an hour one. <laughs> uh, remember, let me just remind myself. Um, at eight o'clock, there's a full list being published of all the stuff I have coming up in both April and March. But I also have the list here somewhere april and may i mean sorry my own brain and i'm remembering what the next one is next one is the 14th of april and it's the war emergency flotillas it's destroyers the war emergency flotillas and how they um have came about what they were built for and um, i have to say that's all very interesting and i'm very looking forward to but there is one i'm looking forward to quite a lot from may which is hms leander through history um, a name to illustrate a navy. I'm trying a trick where I'm going through on the 12th of May, uh, Leander, where she starts off as a fourth rate, then becomes a frigate, frigate again, protected cruiser, then a light cruiser, and then a frigate again. I just think it's interesting to illustrate a navy. And for those looking forward to the landing craft, a bit of a sneak peek. I'm going to be using this book quite a lot for it and pictures from it which hopefully I'm going to have managed to get out and expect to see lots of things like this because landing craft was a passion project of my dad but unfortunately as I think I've told you about here he was a naval architect unfortunately he died a couple of years back um so you know I haven't picked up his project yet but I might do all right, take care. Have a nice evening. Happy Easter to all those who have Easter today. Happy Easter for the 19th for those who are Orthodox Christians and happy Sunday for those who don't do either. Take care and how can I say? <laughs>